What I wanted to talk about was Einstein's theory of relativity because it, it ties in with the speed of light, synchronicity, uh, conventionality that you were talking about earlier. Briefly describe what relativity is, what the theory of relativity is. Uh, relativity is the branch of physics that was discovered by Albert Einstein. Uh, there are two there are two sort of subdivisions in relativity called special relativity and general relativity. And special was discovered in uh, 1905, and then in 1915 he discovered uh, general relativity. Basically, they're the branch of physics that deals with the unusual effects that happen when an object travels at very, very high speeds or uh, in a very intense gravitational field. Uh, special theory, the special theory of relativity ignores gravity. The general theory includes gravity. And so what we what we found what Einstein discovered was that space and time are a little different than than what p most people uh, think they are. They're not sort of absolute and the same everywhere. Clocks don't. Our, our natural expectation is to think that that clocks all tick at the same rate if they're if they're well constructed clock. Okay, you got a good one. You got a Rolex, and it's it's going to take a licking and keep on ticking, right? The the assumption is that that uh, no matter how you move, it doesn't affect the rate at which time flows. And the effect indeed is so small that we don't notice it in our er everyday lives, but, but Einstein was able to figure out rationally from, from really just uh, two observations that time is affected by motion. The, the, the flow of time, the rate at which clocks tick, is affected by motion. And, uh, and also lengths are affected by motion. And so, uh, you know, how, how thick you are depends on how fast you're moving. That's kind of interesting. And again, it's not something we would notice in our everyday experiences because the effect is very small. It's not until you get up to a substantial fraction of the speed of light that the effects become significant. Uh, so, but that's really what it is. It's the, it's, the, it's the physics dealing with very, very high speeds or very intense gravitational fields. So the theory of relativity is that time and space or matter are relative to what? They're relative to the speed of light, interestingly, and the round trip speed of light. One of the, the peculiarities that was discovered in the late 1800s is that the speed of light, uh, no matter how you measure it, the round trip speed of light is always 186,282 miles per second. And this is that's a very peculiar. I want to give you an example of this. Suppose that, that you're in a car and you're driving 50 miles an hour. And, and somebody in the back seat takes a baseball and throws it, and they're capable of throwing a baseball at 50 miles an hour, and so they throw it out the window. Now, someone on the sidewalk would see that ball traveling at 100 miles an hour, wouldn't they? Because it would be the speed of the car plus the speed of the baseball. It would be 100 miles an hour. That's called the Galilean velocity addition theorem. Okay? You just add the velocities. But what's peculiar is light doesn't work that way. If I'm, if I'm traveling down the road at half the speed of light, and I turn my headlights on, and they're moving the speed of light faster than me, which is C, I'm traveling at half C, you'd think somebody on the sidewalk would see the light traveling at 1.5 C, 50% faster, but he doesn't. Somehow he, st he sees the speed of light as C faster than him, whereas I see the speed of light as C faster than me, even though I'm moving relative to him. Very peculiar. And Einstein realized that the resolution to that paradox is uh, it, entailed by the fact that my clock doesn't tick at the same rate as someone on the sidewalk, and so the way I measure time is different, and lengths change, and so the way my, my rulers are not the same as a person's uh, who's stationary on the sidewalk. So if you're traveling at three quarters the speed of light, your ruler is different yeah. than the man standing on the sidewalk right next to you as you pass by. Right. If you could right. take a snapshot from a, a, from a neutral perspective, your ruler and his ruler would be different lengths, even though they might be one foot rulers. That's right. Because you're traveling at the speed of light, therefore, the length of everything relative to you has shrunk. Correct? Yes. And, and the, the thing that's surprising to people is when, when you're moving, you do not notice any of these effects because everything shrinks together. Okay, and so you might say, well, this roller seems just as long as it used to be. It's still the length of my arm, but that's because your arm is also shrunk in that direction and so on. So everything, everything moves together. You, your time might be slowed down, and so you're moving very slowly, and your clock is ticking very slowly, but you don't notice it because your brain is slowed at the same rate your watch is. 
And so everything slows together. And so you don't notice the effects in your own car or in your own spaceship or whatever you're, you're in that's moving at some substantial fraction of the speed of light. But somebody watching you with the telescope would notice that inside your chamber there, you're moving very slowly. And the faster you get to the speed of light, the slower and slower time flows. So give us a thought experiment with the traveling to a distant star, say Alpha Centauri, um, traveling at the speed of light. What would the effects of that time dilation and that space dilation be? So the, as you move closer and closer to the speed of light, since time slows down, you age very slowly. But uh, from your perspective, it doesn't seem that way. It seems like time's flowing normally. But from, but from your perspective, as you're moving very fast, you're, you're always allowed to consider yourself stationary, you see. I mean, we don't feel like we're moving, do we? We're in this room, we're, we're on the Earth, that the Earth's rotating, and you know, we're moving at 700 miles per hour relative to the center of the Earth in a uh, easterly direction. And then we're orbiting around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. You don't feel that, right? Because it's a smooth motion. So the person who's in the spaceship, from his perspective, it's the universe that's moving backwards at a substantial fraction of the speed of light. So from, and, and so from his perspective, since things shrink in the direction of motion, that star that was very distant is now not so distant because the universe is compressed in the direction of motion, interestingly. And so what happens, let's say it's a star that's, say, uh, four light years away, Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, is 4.3 4 light years away. So uh, you'd say, well, it's going to take at least 4.3 years to get there because we can't move faster than the speed of light. We can only move slower than the speed of light. So I, I move up to a very high speed, as close as to light as I can get. The person on the ship would be able to make the trip in, say, a couple of months. Because from his point of view, the, the, the universe shrank in the direction that he's traveling, and so that it didn't take very long to get there. Now, a person on Earth would say, no, the reason you were able to make that trip in what seems like two months is because your clock was running very slowly. And so they both agree, everybody agrees that they're able to make the trip in, the astronaut is able to make the trip aging only a couple of months. They disagree on the explanation for why, because the explanation is relative to the person's point of view. So that's, why the, that's where it gets its name. So twin astronauts, one stays on Earth, one gets in a ship and heads off to Alpha Centauri, yeah. makes the trip there and comes back, what happens? So if he comes back and meets his twin, his twin would have aged uh, 8.6 years, whereas the astronaut would have aged barely, you know, four months, say, depending on the speed. So the twins are now different ages. So very interesting. Is, time tra is, is traveling at the speed of light possible? And if not, why not? So it turns out traveling at the speed of light is not possible unless you're light. Okay, light travels at the speed of light. Anything that has no mass has to travel, no rest mass, has to travel at the speed of light. Anything that has mass, though, can't ever reach it because there's a, there's a third effect that kicks in. We talked about how lengths compress as you go faster and faster. Your time slows down as you go faster and faster. The third effect that kicks in is mass increases. Mass goes up. Something, things get heavier. And, so, uh, and, and when something's heavier, it takes more force to accelerate it. And so it turns out that in the limit, as you approach the speed of light, your mass would go up to infinity, and it would take an infinite amount of force to get you any faster. So you can't ever push something up to the speed of light. You can get arbitrarily close, but you can never reach it. And if you reach the speed of light, or you got close to the speed of light, is time travel possible? Well, in a, in a way, yes, because in a sense, we're already traveling through time, because, right, I'm going from 12, 45, 47 seconds to 48 to 49. We're moving forward in time now. Now, the interesting thing is you can increase the rate at which you move through time by simply moving through space. And so if you wanted to, you could, you could uh, travel at a very close to the speed of light out to a distant star and come back, and you could, you could see the future of the Earth. You could, you could come back, it'd be 100 years later here, but from your point of view, the trip only take, takes a couple of months. So that's a, time of, that's a type of time travel. But if you wanted so, to come so back... Second, say that again. <clears throat> because, yeah, let's just say that again. I'm not going to admit how stupid I feel after that. So you could travel two months at near the speed of light, or at yeah. the speed of light, to yeah. some place and come back. Yeah. When you got back, you would be two years, two months older. Yeah. But everybody here would have been. You would see your grandchildren and maybe your yeah. great grandchildren. Yeah. So you would be traveling into the future of our planet, but not your future of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got the right idea. That's it. So can you, yeah, can we effect travel to the past. Effectively, you're eight. You're, you're aging, and there's the problem. If you say, well, okay, I want to come back and tell my wife about this, that I met my distant kid, but I'm sorry, she's dead, and you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't go back. Because in order to go back in time, you'd have to go faster than light. If you can go faster than light, you can go back in time. But so you can't go faster than light. Therefore, you can't go back in time. Are you telling me that Endgame and Back to the Future are not sorry, actual possible? Sorry, it's not going to. 
It's not going to happen. What it's is the logical problem with uh, traveling back into the past, and why, why does that logical problem mean that we can never go back in the past? The, well, one of the issues is called, sometimes called the grandfather paradox. In principle, it would be, if you could go back in time, in principle, you could, although it would be ill-advised, you could go back and assassinate your grandfather before he ever even met your grandmother, in which case your, your father's never born, in which case you're never born. But if you're never born, then how can you possibly go back and assassinate your grandfather, you see? And so you end up with a paradox. On the one hand, you must exist in order to cause his death. On the other hand, you can't exist because he, was, he, he died. And so it leads to a logical contradiction, and that which leads to a con contradiction is false. Therefore, time travel into the past is false. Did you catch the logical math behind that, everyone? Okay. Um, Back to the Future, basically. It's false. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. But it's a good movie. It's fun. Now, your, your uh, paradigm that you have proposed for um, rescuing the starlight time issue problem um, that rescue device, would you call it a rescue device? Uh, no, because it's testable. Rescuing devices are not testable by their nature. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. Yeah. And it is a way of explaining how distant starlight can get to the Earth. And here, I'll, I'll try and state it in how I would state it and you see if this is accurate. Okay. You are saying that we can only know the round trip speed of light. We cannot yeah. know the one directional speed of light. So it is possible that the speed of light going away from us could be instant, coming back to us, it would be half of what we observe, or it's possible that the speed of light coming toward us is instant, mm -hmm. and away from us would be half of, of yeah. what we observe. Correct. Round trip wise. Yep, that's right. Anybody who tries to measure the speed of light has to make certain assumptions regarding what they're measuring and how they're measuring it. All those assumptions are built into it. Yeah. So you yeah. have, you have yeah. essentially proposed a hypothesis that is impossible to disprove, is that correct? Well, there's, there's, two, there's, two, there's a nuance to this, because the, uh, the hypothesis that it is impossible to measure the one-way speed of light could be falsified if somebody would simply measure the one-way speed of light without s assuming it. So the hypothesis that the one-way speed of light is untestable is itself a testable hypothesis. If, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Did you follow that? Okay. Um, on the other hand, the one-way speed of light itself is not testable. No, I follow that, but say it again for the people who might not have. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, the, what's called the conventionality thesis. The conventionality thesis is the proof, the supposition, the hypothesis that you can't measure the one-way speed of light without circular assumptions, without first assuming it. Now, you could, in principle, falsify that by measuring the one-way speed of light without circular assumptions, but nobody has figured out how to do that. And I, I think that hypothesis is actually, I think it's more than a hypothesis. I think it's been proven. Uh, John Winnie in 19, not everybody agrees with this proof, but John Winnie in 1970 showed that relativity works equally well no matter what the one-way speed of light is. You can make it anything you want. So this, the one-way speed of light is a convention. Now, my saying that, that this one-way speed of light is a convention, is itself a testable statement. Because if you could somehow objectively measure the one-way speed of light without first assuming it, then you would, you would falsify my, my statement. You would falsify my hypothesis. But nobody's been able to do that. Your hypothesis that the... And I'm going I'm to suggest that what you're suggesting is not that the light travels instantly from us, but that the light traveling to us relative to our point of observation is instant. Okay. Therefore, we are seeing in real time what is happening in the Andromeda galaxy. Sort of. One little nuance, though. That's, I'm not proposing that as a hypothesis. I'm proposing that as a convention, which is what Einstein said it was. He said the, the, the one-way speed of light, he said it's neither a, a, a hypothesis uh, about, it's neither a hypothesis nor a supposition about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. In other words, what he's saying is, we get to choose the one-way speed of light to be whatever we like, and then that will define what constitutes synchronized clocks. That's the only way to do it. Because there's no objective way to synchronize two clocks separated by a distance, unless you, unless you suppose the one-way speed of light. And so that's, that's the part that I've had, I've had difficulty communicating that to, to, to laymen, because it is a hard concept. It's difficult, because we tend to think of space and time as absolute. They're not. And so... As a result of that, there's no way, there's no objective way to synchronize two clocks that everyone in the universe would agree on. 
That's called the relativity of simultaneity. And as a result of that, it's impossible to measure exactly any one-way speed. We can do it approximately, but you can't actually measure the one-way speed of light, and therefore it's something that we get to choose. And I'm suggesting not that the speed of light is instantaneous toward us in the sense that that's right, and the other definition of it being the same in all directions is wrong. I'm just suggesting they're two different conventions, like the metric system or the English system. You want to measure table and feet? You can do that. You want to measure it in meters? You can do that too. You'll get a different number but it's reflecting the same reality. The length of the table doesn't change. So the convention of different ways of measuring the speed of light is something that's consistent with Einstein's theory. Yes. And what you have postulated or suggested is consistent with Einstein's theory. Yeah. It works for a young Earth cre creationist perspective. Yeah. And then the kicker is that if you take God's word as serious as what he, what he is describing in Scripture as inspired, then we have people in Scripture and God describing events that happened billions of light years away as happening in real time yes, from our right. vantage point. That's right. So that yep. seems to suggest as if God is using the same convention of measuring the speed of light, that it is instant toward us. We're seeing events in real time. Yes. I believe the Bible is using that anisotropic synchrony convention. And by the way, all ancient cultures did until around the time of it. Well, at least until the 1600s. Everybody used that convention. Do you know, you, now you've suggested this as a way of resolving that issue. Do you know of any astrophysicists or any of your peers who are secular that reject the timeline of Scripture, Old Earth, do you know of any of them that know of your hypothesis, have read it and interacted with it, and have admitted that they are unable to disprove that? Yeah, yeah. Have any of them disproved it? No, they, no, they haven't disproved it. Uh, in fact, I've had uh, um, secular physicists, if they, if they know Einstein's physics, they know that, that what I'm saying works. They, they understand the conventionality thesis. And it's kind of interesting. I had one guy, there's one guy who was, he was a grad student in physics, but he knew his stuff. He knew relativity. And, and he interacted with me a little bit and asked me some questions. And he, and he understood. He did, he's not a younger creationist by any means. And then he, and he got onto a secular blog where folks were, were making fun of my model. And he says, you, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You can't, you can't criticize him for that. You, you know, he's, he's play, they said, he's playing you like a fish. And of course, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to fool anybody. It's just they didn't know their physics. And they thought what I was proposing was new. It's not. What I'm proposing is well established in the literature. And, and again, uh, John Winnie's article, he's, there was actually two articles uh, called the... Um, uh, Special Relativity Without One-Way Velocity Assumptions, Part 1 and Part 2. And he showed that all relativity works without one-way assumptions. There's another article by Wesley Salmon called The Philosophical Significance of the One-Way Speed of Light. What, what I presented to you today is not new. It's just nobody ever, as far as I know, I'm the first person to realize that that solves the distant starlight problem. That's, the, that's my minor contribution, is to point out that it solves the starlight problem. But the fact that the one-way speed of light is conventional is well known in the physics literature. It's, so the it physics really of your theory, the, the postulates of your theory have been around for years. Yeah. You just simply applied it to this and said, then that is the solution, and it's already in the physics of Einstein. Yeah, that's right. So what is covered in that book, The Physics of Einstein, for, um, I've, I've read it, so if, if anybody, has anybody else here read that, The Physics of Einstein? No? Okay, I read it in preparation for what we're going through here. I never understood the theory of relativity. I thought it was Einstein's way of trying to figure out the complex family tree in Clark Fork. <laughs> had no idea that had anything to do with anything else. I'd never even studied or thought through it. I read, I read Jason's book, and what he does is he begins uh, back in history, 1500s, 1400s, whenever some of these theories with Galileo, and who else was it? Well, yeah, Gal Galileo was the main guy who came up. He was the Galilean Velocity Edition Theorem. So that's okay. the one I started with. Yeah, yeah he, he starts with that, and then he kind of builds on until he gets to Einstein, and then rather than just dumping Einstein's theory on you and all of its glory, Jason does the hard work of laying it out layer by layer, postulate by postulate, until you get it. And there's great thought experiments, illustrations like the space travel to a distant universe and what would happen with twins. He does all of that to show you how, and he just builds one thing after another, first time dilation and space dilation, and then matter and mass and energy and how all of it's tied together until you arrive at Einstein's theory. And then he applies it to some of the stuff that we're talking about here. Black holes, uh, which is fascinating, time travel, which is another one, and the distant starlight problem. So it is a very, I, I was able to understand it and I know nothing about that field uh, before stepping into it. All right, let me give you a couple of questions here from relating to Einstein's theory. What do you think about the emerging theory that black holes can create a big bang after a big crunch, that something came from nothing naturally. Okay, well, um, 
black holes aren't strongly connected to the, the big crunch theory. They're, they used to think, this was decades ago, they, that um, uh, the, folks who believed in the Big Bang thought that the universe might expand to a certain point and then fall back in on itself and you'd end up with an inverted Big Bang, which they called the Big Crunch. And then in some versions of that, it would rebound, boom, and you get another Big Bang, another Big Crunch, boom. And that cycle might be eternal. And so that's, that's what the big crunch is. Um, as far as I know, nobody believes that anymore. And, and one of the reasons is the, the outward energy of expansion exceeds the inward pull of gravity. And so the universe is, is it's going to continue to expand forever. All our observations indicate, uh, based on the physics that we understand, the universe will expand forever. And so there can't be a big crunch. So that's, that's been pretty well eliminated. Even the secularists don't buy into that anymore. All right, if your theory about the one-way speed of light is correct, we wouldn't be able to see any planets farther than 6,000 light years away as their light would be reflected. Is this consistent with what can be observed through a telescope? Yeah, first, a, first explain yeah, the question. That's a great question. That's a great question. So uh, because planets shine by reflected light, uh, the light needs to go from the sun and hit the planet and then come back, you see. And the, the speed of light can only be instant in one direction, just once. And so that, we, that can explain why we see distant stars, because the light only has to go from there to here. But for planets, it, the light has to go out from the sun, hit the planet, and then come back. And so, yes, it is true that planets in our solar system that, that shine by reflected sunlight, you would not be able to see them if they were more than, that's actually 3,000, if they're more than 3,000 light years out, because remember, light travels out at half C. And so, uh, even though the return trip would be instant. But of course, our solar system isn't that big. The uh, uh, Neptune, let's see, Neptune's what, about four hours away, four light hours away. So for, for light to get from the sun, to even, regardless of what you believe about one-way speed of light, for light to get out to Neptune and then come back and hit the Earth, it takes eight hours. So all the planets in our solar system would have been visible by the, end of day, by the end of day four. All of them would have been visible. It is true, though, that if you had planets out at tremendous distances, you wouldn't be able to see them by sunlight. Now, there are planets in other solar systems that we can see, that are far out, but they're shining by the reflected light of their star, and that doesn't take very long to get there. It takes a few hours. So that's a very ingenious question. All right. Since motion affects the passage of time, is that why car clocks never keep time? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's not. The, the, um, the effects of relativity on the slowing of time are minuscule, and they're not something you're ever going to see. Because... Uh, in order to see a 1% time dilation, in order for a clock to be ticking 1% slower than a, a stationary clock, you would have to move at 14% the speed of light. And none of you have cars that can get up to 14% the speed of light. By the way, that would be about the equivalent of uh, if you were to travel around the Earth in one second. Can you imagine that? Making it traveling around the Earth in one second, you'd be traveling at about 14% the speed of light. So if we put, a, we put a clock on Superman and we have him fly around the Earth in one second and he comes back, um, he would, there would be a 1% difference, difference between his clock and my clock. He would have experienced time dilation. So at ordinary speeds, at 50 miles an hour, the effects are negligible. You can't measure them. And you might say, well, how do we measure them at all? And the answer is using atomic clocks. That's how it's been measured. The, uh, the, one of the first experiments to, to measure time dilation had airplanes fly around the world in opposite directions. And because the Earth's rotating, the, the plane that's flying westward is effectively stationary. The Earth's just rotating underneath it, whereas the other one is, is moving substantially. And even though it's, a, it's not even close to 14, or not even close to 14 percent speed of light, nonetheless, the atomic clocks could measure even the very small difference. But unless your car has an atomic clock, you're, you're never going to notice you're never going to notice any difference. Uh, atom, car clocks aren't very accurate because they're not very well built. That's all it comes down to. Yeah. So while you are moving, while you are in motion, while all of us are in motion, you are technically time is traveling slower for you. Yeah. You that's are right. thinner and shorter, that's and right. distance is has shrunk. Yeah. But so negligible that we never notice it, never can notice it. That's right. That's right. And but the, it's but it's a real. The, Phenomenon, nonetheless. It is. It is. And, in fa and gravity is another um, uh, factor, too. Gravity also slows the passage of time. And so the fact that we're sitting here in a gravitational field as opposed to in deep space causes our clocks to tick just slightly slower. And therefore, you're aging very slightly slower than if you had a twin who lived out in space in zero G, you would age slightly slower. And I figured out the difference one time. I thought, what, what, you know, what, what is the difference of the effect? And the answer is, if you lived to be 70 years old, you would gain an extra two seconds 
for living on the earth in a gravitational field. That's the difference. It's tiny. It's tiny.